Today, I'm going to go ahead and I'll record this lecture. But today, what we're going to do at first is we are going to go over the um, the first cup, the quiz four and quiz five. <coughs> <coughs> Mints. All right. I quiz six should be uh, done by the end of the week. Um, and then I'll have that be due like close to the end of the semester, since that's um, you know, and that you know, essentially optional if you're happy with your grades. Um, but um, as far as quiz four and quiz five, I noticed people could, some people couldn't see their, uh, their feedback for quiz four and quiz five. So what's taking so long is I'm manually going through and grading uh, the questions. And I'm going to go through and um, talk about some of the things that led the grader to believe it was wrong, even though actually some people were right because there's, actually, because there's always in different interpretations of some problems, especially for the first one we're going to go over. Um, and the first two problems actually do have some very interesting features to them, which is pretty good. Um, and then depending on the uh, on what the class wants, I can either move forward and talk about recursion or I can uh, talk about uh, more about regular expressions. So uh, either way. So we'll burn that bridge when we get to, get to it. But let's go ahead and get started with. Uh, talking about the quiz or the quizzes. So let's take a look at quiz four. So um, the first question for quiz four is, uh, how often does red and scarlet appear in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's The Study in Scarlet? Use the scarlet.txt file to determine and return your values as red count and scarlet count. So um, let's just go ahead and show you how this actually worked, the auto grading. So if we go into edit question, it comes up with uh, some code here. So first off, notice uh, what we've got here. Active code, the, the key for the, um, the key identifier for the uh, problem. And then it grades it by doing a unit test. What is a unit test? Unit tests are basically tests, uh, uh, are, is code that tests other code. Um, so over here, we've got our question. Um, and if I provide code to the user, I put it in here. And then this is the stuff I use to test your code or somebody else wrote. Um, now, over here, it had some hard-coded values to check, which was 367 and two. Um, now, part of the issue here was, um, there were actually two ways to interpret this problem, which is how many times, because they ask how many times does red and scarlet appear in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle? Okay. Uh, and there's two, and believe it or not, there's two ways to interpret that. That is how often does the string red occur and how often does the word red occur? And what they're grading on, what the auto grader was going on and what I just, and what I corrected, if you check your grade from last night was the, uh, well, a lot of students did was, it, sorry, it wanted the number of times the string occurred. And then this gives you the number of times the word occurred. So, um, so what's the difference? Uh, well, like scattered, that has uh, red in it. Anything that ends with R-E-D has red in it. And so that's what was counted. Um, no, Ben, you're fine. If you've got a grade, you're fine. So over here, what we're going to do is that we can, so let's go ahead and take a look about like what, what they, uh, some easy ways to solve this problem. Okay. So first thing I'm going to do is open, uh, our file, uh, Scarlet. Some of you also initially had a poor grade because that or, you know, just misspelling errors, that's fine. You weren't really penalized for that. Uh, if you were, it was like a point because 
it wasn't perfect, but you got the answer there. Okay, I, I, I that's um and and again the auto grader isn't useless. It you know I see a twenty or you know or a zero and it's like aha I'm good to go. So scarlet.txt. So this is the file, and now we are going to read it. Um, text is equal to, and I'm just going to go with file dot read over here. And that's gonna store the entire text file in there. There's other ways to do it. Now, some people, what they did was that they did, so now this is after that, once you get to this point, actually there's multiple interpretations. Some people were like read, some people will read lines, doesn't really matter. Um, some people will read and then they did a split. But here's what kind of the, uh, the person who wrote this and then created this poorly worded question was expecting, which was, uh, which is that they were expecting you to do something along like this, a text dot count read equals read count. And if we run this, we get uh, this answer. Uh, some people decide, would put it into lowercase. And that actually would get you three more than the ones you wanted because apparently he cared, whoever wrote this cared about this, uh, you know, did not consider case sensitivity or whatnot. Again, that's why I had to, why I had to go through with this one for everybody, um, because there were just so many things that were. It's a good question. Like, sorry, it's a good concept to test on. Um, some another way that some people did this is uh, they did file dot read, and then dot split, or they did read lines that split. Okay. Or, and basically you so for word in text and, they, and i'm just doing red count over here because once you see how to do red it's pretty obvious how to do uh do um what you call it as soon as you see red it's easy to figure out how to do scarlet for word in text if red count is red sorry not if red count is red uh, if if word is red Red count plus equals one. And then um, you counted five red and you get something like the answer. That's literally the amount of times the word red appears. But what the, again, what the author of this, of this problem wrote, he was looking for the string and that was ambiguous. That's again, part of the reason why I, why I'm going through everything and, the auto grader is only useful for telling me who's definitely right. But everybody understand how to solve this problem? Basically, you open the file and you either split it or you count it. It also depends on the interpretation of what we want. Any questions on this one before I move on? Well, why does it ask if it is like, why does it say 365 when the answer is really five? Um, this is what it's looking for. This is what we got. That's the number of times the word red appears. Versus. Uh-huh. Versus uh versus this. If this makes sense. I'll be going over all the questions. Isn't that the same thing? Nope. They are not the same thing. So this is when we're asked. So let's go ahead and put them next to each other. And, the, and because they represent two vastly different interpretations of the problem, neither of which I counted as in, incorrect because both are legitimate interpretations without any elaboration. Okay, so what does this one do? This one counts, hey, okay, so here I've split up the text file into individual words, right? Here I'm going to print just, I'm not gonna print the entire list because that'd be awful. Instead, what I'm gonna print is, I'm gonna print a small slice, uh, text in 
Make sense? The Project Gutenberg book of a study in Scarlet Bi. So we've got each of our, each of these things. Okay, so this, so for every word in here and ignore the, uh, the punctuation because we can always filter that out. But what this one is asking for is this the word red? Is this the word red? Is this the word red? I said the, uh, the, I said at the beginning that quiz six will be due close to the end of the semester because you, to give you plenty of time to do it. Um, whereas this is asking, is red a substring of this? Does this string contain the word red? Does this substring contain the word red? Does that make sense? So for instance, if I gave this scatter, if, if the word it was looking at was uh, scattered, this is a no, but this would be a yes. Does that make sense? Wait, so can, do you mind just repeating that last part again, please? Sorry? Can you repeat that last part again, please? So if, so this ask, so this is asking if red is in word. Red, R-E-D is in scattered. So yes, this would be true. This is asking, is this the same as this? Is red the same as word? They are not. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. So red, it's just, it's seeing if red. It's is going exactly each... equal versus the subset operation. Right, okay, gotcha. Interesting, thank you. So that's why, there, so there are two different interpretations. Both interpretations were right. Uh, the, I did take off like a point if you did an elif statement over here or something. Um, I don't know why you can't look at your quiz answers. That's part of the reason I'm going over them this today. I can always pull up your quiz answers for you in office hours though. Uh, but you, I don't know why you, you sh were you able to look at your quiz? So next question, because this was the other one. Uh, choose, uh, create a file that's called dataset.txt, which, uh, and this is the other one I graded last night. Um, so load the supplied X and Y value so the, my, uh, so the file matches the style below. When writing the data to file, be aware you don't want a new line on the last line. I actually added that last bit. So that's weird. But then again, that's part of the reason I'm going over this today. All right, so this is the file, data, uh, dataset.txt. Now, part of the issue here, uh, the biggest thing that lost people points is that if you hard coded this, if you hard code putting these uh, values in, I took off points because you didn't you know, do a for loop and iterate over these values. Um, but hard coding X and Y is okay, right? Yes, that's fine. What I'm saying is hard coding like the one, two, gotcha. Yeah. Like if you put file.write one, two, file.write two, comma four, file.write three, comma six, and literally three, comma six. So as opposed to doing a loop to iterate it over it. I'm not sure what's going up with Runestone that you can't see previous answers. Okay. Um, so file. So file, um, gee, I'm not sure what is up with that. I'll have to compare this to the previous quizzes and see if there's a setting I need to check. Um, file open data underscore set dot txt. Okay, and we need uh, to say I want to. Actually, yeah, I want to write this file. I want to write it. W for write. So now what we're getting into here is called the fence posting problem again, which is that, uh, and I'll, I'll kind of show what the issue is in a second after I do this. Now, because this is fairly straightforward, um, what I want to do. So first off, I want the file to have an X and Y at the top. So I'll just simply say file dot write 
you know, X comma Y. And then I will do file.close at the end to make sure I do this does. Uh, some people forgot the parentheses. That's, you know, very minor. So when I did file.close, by the way, I get this output, which is nice. Um, and you can see that it's like checking file created, something written in the file. And it's not correct, obviously, because we've got X, Y here and we need the numbers, right? So file.open, file.write. So now what we have to do is iterate for, um, and so there's a couple ways we can do this. The first and most natural way is to use for i in, so for index in range length of x. So because both x and y are the same range, and I can say x val is equal to x, the item at index at in x at index. And Y val, does that make sense? Basically because of the same length, I can get their values at the index. And then I can do file dot write. Um, and I have to turn these into strings, unfortunately. X val. plus comma plus tr. One of the things I don't like about Python, like I love Python for almost everything and I bash on Java in my Java class uh, for a lot of things. But if there's one thing I bash about Python is the fact that I have to convert everything to strings if I wanna, as opposed to it automatically being converted to a string for me. Okay. And what's cool is, um, oh, what am I forgetting here? New lines, of course. because my fingers are just doing terrible today. Okay, and run it, and now it should be separated. Oh, oh wait, one, two. Ah, forgot, I need a new line over here. It's not like print, you have to manually put in your new lines. There we go, obvious. And so now we've got X, Y, one, two, three, four, five, six, sorry, one, two, two, four, three, six, four, eight, five, ten. So this matches that we are done. Wait a second. We're not done. What's wrong? What's different between the files? That little thing I said at the bottom, which is that new line. It's like a minor thing that normally doesn't matter. I didn't really take off a, that many points. I think I took off a point for missing that. But the point being is that this is a, uh oh. So, um, so this is again, the fence posting problem where basically we have one more new line than we need. Um, and it's not like a list where I can just go back and snip it off. Uh, I, I've, I've wrote, I've, it is written. So what I need to do is not write it. So there's a couple ways to do that. Um, the first way is to manipulate this range. Go up to, but do not include the very last item. And then, manually write that item. And so that would be the last item in X. Okay, first off, we, ah, no, I wanted to control V, not control C, the thing I was gonna about to control V over. Silly fingers, okay. Okay. So, so I want to get rid of this new line because I do not want a new line there anymore. So this will print out basic, so what this will do is that this will write, this will write all of the data, 
all of the, this will write these items over here. And then I'll manually write the last bit without this new line. Uh, there's basically no way to automatically do it without a, uh, like that, uh, like, you know, there's basically just no automatic way to do that. Um, although the other solution is, is that we do not have to modify this. Okay. But then how do we get around that? With an if statement, which is that if index is less than, um, which is that we're going to remove the new line over here. And then I'll say, and if index is less than len x minus one, then, then and only then I will file dot write a new line character. So as long as I'm not on the last line, I'm going to write it. Okay. So this one, fairly straightforward. Create a list called J emotions that contains every word in, in emotion words.txt that begins with the letter J. So here, the, the pitfall was you know, reading the question, I think, which was basically, well, let's see, creating, first off, we want to create a list called J emotions. List created, run. Okay. And then it's got, it's checking to make sure, do we have all the words in there? So uh, we have to now read this file, but here we're not counting how many, which is what some students do. Um, I cannot share the link to this. This is the quiz. Uh, and if I shared this link, you would just be on the uh, page that you would not have access to. So this is the quiz that we did. I'm going over all the questions for the quiz. Because at this point, I'm expecting everybody to have taken the quiz. And that everybody who I gave uh, gave extensions to has already been taken care of. So anyway, well, that's a problem. Uh, please speak with me, uh, send me an email. Um, if you have, probably, probably best. I mean, the point is, well, I mean, let me go ahead, hold on one second. Stop screen sharing for a second or pause sharing because now I got to check my email. And search. Did you send me an email about not taking the quizzes? Because uh, the quizzes have a fairly strict deadline if you did not have like some kind of exception that the, the sent me. We can talk about it later though. Oh, well, that's convenient. All right, let's go ahead and resume. All right, so for this one, yeah, I mean, like some people, they got sick because, uh, look, I'll be frank with you guys, this is not a normal semester. Uh, typically, I get, I, I get two emails a, a semester along the lines, one or two a semester along the lines of, uh, I, I need extensions because I had a family member who passed away. And I'm averaging about two a week now. This is not a normal semester. So that's why I've uh, been uh, lenient with some deadlines.
All right, so we're going to open emotion underscore words.txt. Let's remember to wrap that in a string and let's remember to read it and not put an extra period here because that seems silly. Okay, uh, and now file. And now what are we going to do? We are going to simply see, we are going to, let's go ahead and read this. Um, for word in, let's see, for, let's do it this way instead for just for giggles. For line in file, for word in line dot split, if word, so how do we tell if it begins with the letter? If word zero, let's go ahead, sorry, if word, is great, you know, if, if word, length of, I'll only put that in if that actually creates an error. So word is equal equals J. If the first letter is J, Let's see how if this worked. Yep. So for every word in the file, so I, I for every line in the file, I checked every word in the line, and then I said, "Hey, is the first character J? Add it to this list." It's a fairly straightforward uh, uh, one. Um, the main mistake I've seen students make is that they counted the number of, of words rather than telling giving me what I, what was asked for. Uh, this one, I'm, this one should be fairly straightforward. L if is just a bunch of L if statements. I'm going to move on from this one unless people really demand it. Um, so quiz, let me just now, let's see. I want visible to students to check, show late submissions. And now quiz one, you've been able to see your, things and I don't see any settings differently here. So that's weird. So quiz five, let's go on. So quiz five, I haven't gotten to yet in terms of the grading. We have uh, these five problems. First two problems were basically, um, most of the problems I've seen for this one, for, uh, for the metal count one are uh, typos. Which again, why part of the reason I'm going through it manually, <laughs> typos. But it's fine. That happens to me. You got you made a typo. I'm giving you nine out of ten points. If you got it wrong because you didn't do it, zero. You're gonna get zero. But again, typo is the primary reason. Like um, untied states. Um, I have seen multiple people misspell. So if you feel called out, it's not. It's not. Same with this one. Uh, this one prop, you know, so let's go to this one. Oh yeah. Yeah. Another person said, uh, put in the, uh, other people put in a typo, like the United States. That's not actually a typo. That's people being, uh, that's people following the direction. So no, that won't be counted off. But I'm, I'm, I, again, that's one of the, when I'm talking about typos, I'm talking about people, you know, misspelling actually stuff. All right. So this one, so this notation over here is pretty cool. Um, this is notation you probably haven't seen before, but what it is, is that it's a way of saying, Hey, this function I'm writing, it's going to return a dictionary. So that's pretty cool. One second. Jen, just Turn on my light again. That's good. Okay, counter string. So contain a right, create a function that returns a dictionary containing the number of upper and lowercase characters in a string. Ignore white space characters. Your function should be able to handle an empty string, though. Okay. So joy. Um 
there's a couple ways of doing this. The brute force way of doing this is the is is fairly straightforward though, which is um, let's go ahead and define some uh, lowers. So first off, let's create our our dictionary. Um, I'm gonna just call it output is equal to a dictionary is equal to a dictionary. Lowers is equal to uh, yeah, this is a terrible way to do it, but hey, if you're not sure of your functions, that's fine. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, and Z. The things you go to college for, right? Um, now, what is the, now this works. What is the hazard of me doing it like this? If you accidentally miss the letter. Exactly. I'm a human. And humans make sense. So as, as I was saying before I got up, this indicates that this function that this function is going to return a dictionary. So um, what we're going to do here is uppers is equal to uh, lowers dot uppers because if i'm gonna make one i'm making make a mistake i'm only gonna make it in one place lowers upper uh there we go great okay so now for letter in uh string let's go ahead and do this one for letter in string let's do this so for letter in string uh if, okay, and what's cool over here is that uh, we know that this is going to have, we're counting the number of upper and lower cases in the string. So we know that we're going to basically have what the keys are gonna be. Lower, and we know what the value, the starting value is zero. So I can go ahead and just assign them here. Lower, upper, if I don't assign them here, then all I'm going to have to do is, you know, say, oh, have I seen an uppercase uh, character before? But here I can just simply say, hey, if uh, if letter in lowers uh, output, and we can call it output, probably be better called count, but whatever. Output is equal to lower. and it needs the string. Well, if letter in uppers output upper and then and then return output run. And I haven't gotten into grading this yet, but ooh, nice. I haven't gotten into grading this yet, but so long as it resembles this and you're actually doing the counting, that's what I care about. All right, so this one, I think uh, tortured people, but I'm gonna have to check. So let's see, define a function called named word count that counts the number of times words occur in a given string. The function must accept the string in a parameter and return a dictionary where the key is every unique word and its value the number of times each word occurs in a string. For instance, Instance rock ties with rock should give you rock ties with rock. Categorization should not be case sensitive. The string with no words returns an empty dictionary. Okay, so count is equal to no need for the P over there. And I, I hope you're all finding this useful. I figure basic it, rather than just getting silent feedback. Return count. 
So this looks fine as it is. And if we run this, we well, you can't do this, but notice that it checks you on a lot of different uh, random outputs, which is cool. Okay, so uh, what we need to do here is for, um, so, and again, this is gonna get into a thing, a bit of a subtle thing, I'm sure. I'm not sure. Let's, um, let me go ahead and copy. If I go back, so, so asking, does that return an error? Yes, you can submit uh, exercises at the end of the due, uh, uh, you can do exercises up until the end of the semester. Doesn't look like it gives us an error or it does, but I'm gonna return a list instead. There we go, okay. Yeah, it's, it's, an, it's, it's causing an error, but not because of this. I think this is just a suggestion. Python is, uh, cool. It, it's it's an interesting feature that some people try to mandate and it's not always there. Yeah. I mean, there's ways to make your computer enforce it, I think. All right, def word count string, Python count. Okay. So what we're going to do here is that we need to, we've got this string. Let's go ahead and split it up. Words is equal to um, string dot split. That's going to give us all the words for word in words. Okay. For words and words. So for each word in our words list, what are we going to do? We are going to, yeah, probably better if I actually name it like this, or word in word list. Basically, I want to ask myself, hey, if word in count, or sorry, if word not in count, am I, if I've not seen this word before, I'm going to count it. Word is equal to one. Else, otherwise, I've not seen it before, so the count, sorry, otherwise, I have seen it before, so the count of the word should be incremented by one. And then I did not get any of these right, which is interesting. Don't you have to lower the whole thing? Ah, yes. Well, let's see. So let's go ahead and see. We can expand my differences here, and it's super tiny. Actual, yep, it certainly want it's doing. Uh, it's doing the separation, the the part of the Declaration of Independence right there. So, um, yes, word dot lower. Run. Yep. So that was all that was we we needed to care about. Um. I think part of it is that uh, you may have got it wrong if you went for punctuation. I don't know if it cared about punctuation or not. I've seen some people have issues where you had extra spaces after each of your words. It's okay. Again, what I care about, did you know how to do the, the whole counting thing? Any quest other questions about this one? All right. So, uh, no, I haven't gotten, I'm trying to get through the quiz uh, five tonight, uh, tonight. I've gotten through, it's, it's been a bit of a tedious process and my home life got a bit crazy this weekend, just with, uh, with 
things being very, very busy. Um, so I'm grading stuff tonight, but it will be manually graded. All the other stuff, except for the quiz, has been updated. But I'm working, I'm actively working on it. Okay. Uh, you're, so I'm, I'm trying to get it done as soon as possible. I know you guys like to have uh, things about your grades. But part of the reason I waited was also because we had a lot of students who needed to take it later. I will be updating the gradebook in Canvas because uh, I haven't done that yet because I'm trying to get the quiz, the accurate quiz grades in first. I I assumed that people wanted that, so uh, otherwise I'd get a lot of panicked emails. Uh, Zainab, uh, send me an email to remind me to take a look at it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so um, what would people like to learn about today? I can talk about, um, I can talk more about regular expressions. I can talk more about, or I can talk about recursion or start talking about recursion. I can extend the deadline for the regex, no problem. Especially since it's extra credit. Let me go ahead and do that now. Okay, then we'll get started on recursion. People seem passionate about that. Um, if you need help on regular expressions, again, check the textbook that's listed in the syllabus, the secondary textbook. It has a lot of uh, resources available to that. Okay, so... While I'm doing that, let me just talk about recursion in general. Recursion is not just a phenomena in computer science, it is a, compu is a phenomena that happens in nature uh, and science and mathematics as well. It's very, very cool to see. Uh, and you, when you see it, when there's examples of it in museum, it is in museums, it is typically very uh, powerful. Recur it's typically uh, associated with art. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay. Um, Let's see, I'm just looking for that. Oh yes, regex over here. Yes, I can make this do much later for, again, this is extra, because again, this is extra credit. So I'll make it do at the end of, I'll make it do right. Yeah, I'll make it do the 20th. I'm gonna be not talking about, I will be talking about object-oriented programming. Uh, Inheritance, not necessarily. That's kind of in 1068, but it's real easy to do. And I, if you're interested in it, I'd be more than happy to kind of talk to you about it. All right. So recursion. Um, do I have a lecture prepared for recursion? Nah, that's fine. I've taught it enough times. I know how to do it. So what is rec So let's go ahead and talk about uh, recursion in give you an example of what we mean visually about what, what recursion is. Uh, recursion in, in art and fractals in art kind of has, it kind of has its own thing. Uh, Google has a little bit of an in-joke where it says, hey, if you search for recursion, it will ask you, did you mean recursion? Which is a recursive answer. Uh, we, so let's go ahead and take a look at art uh, recursion uh, where we see it first in art. Um, do, 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 do. Oh, it says in computer science for, for proofs by recursion, see mathematical induction. Ah, yes, cool. Um, if you've done mathematical induction, you'll know how that works. Uh, recursion. Here we go. So here's a bit of recursive art for you. Uh, this is called the Drost effect. But it's really recursion. And what if we and we uh, look at this? What we'll see is that this woman, this can, the woman on the can is holding a can with herself on it, which in turn is holding a very, very tiny and all, almost hard to see uh, can uh, can on it with herself on it. And presumably that goes on ad infinitum. Uh, we. Uh, we get recursion uh, occurring in um, in mathematics a whole lot. 
but we can also like see this in you know nature of all things lettuce come on broccoli there we go not lettuce where and what does it mean well it means that each part is made up of little or parts that each look like parts of the big or like the big the thing as a whole um so where does this come to come in computer science for computer science recursion is all about well at the end of the day uh and i'm the only one who's going to say this because uh it, it's very cynical recursion is all about being lazy it's saying oh these problems these math problems they're so hard to wait a second have i been have i been lecturing without showing you Ooh. And nobody told me? We can see it. Okay. Okay, weird. Okay. So recur so what we're going to do here it just said my screen sharing was paused, so I was very confused for a second. All right. So let's see control S. Recursion examples. So recursion is all about being lazy in a very interesting kind of way. It's saying, oh, this math is just so hard. I can't do this math. Math is tough. So I'm just going to do this single step of math and, and leave the rest for, for somebody else to do. OK, so can people see my coding, sc my coding screen? Okay, stop share, new share, share screen, and we're going to share the entire screen. Be better? So the first recursive function we are going to talk about is factorial. So, and what is factorial? Well, um, factorial is, is this. That is factorial. Um, it does not mean that we are say our numbers extremely loud. What factorial mean, you know, we're not saying five if you shout really loud equals 120. We're saying that uh, the exclamation point is actually a special operator called factorial. Um, and what is factorial short for? Well, five factorial is equal to five times four times three times two times one. Factorial numbers go up very fast because of this mul multiplicative property. Right, so like three factorial is only three times two times one. Um, three times two times one, so that be, it becomes six, right? Times four, six times four is 20, uh, six times four is 24. And 24 times five is equal to 120. So that's why five factorial is 120. Uh, factorial also has this weird mathematical quirk of a rule where zero factorial is equal to one. We don't need it, although it's useful for defining a stopping point for us. Um, but this is now, but this is an example of a recursive um, problem. Uh, and what do I mean by that? Well, uh, calculating seven factorial is, could be a bit difficult. Okay because that seven times six times five times four times three times two times one, that's a lot, honestly, that's a lot for us to be getting on with. But seven, it doesn't have to look so hard, right? For instance, uh, it's actually a recursive proce process because uh, six, seven factorial is, if you think about it for a second, we can separate it out like this. It's the same as saying seven times six factorial. Make sense? Did I lose anybody there? Right, because what is six factorial? That's six times five times four times three times two times one. 
So seven factorial is just seven times six factorial. Make sense? But uh, seven factorial, but a uh, uh, six factorial, that's hard too, right? So what is six factorial? Well, that's hard to figure out. It's uh, six times five times four times three times two times one. My eyes are already glazing over. I don't know about yours, right? Ah, oh, Ben's got it. So let's be lazy for a second. Six was, six factorial is just same, the same as six times five factorial. And five factorial, we already solved just a couple minutes ago. That's 120. So obviously we can just do it like this, six times. So we've solved what five factorial is. I can do six times 120. And that's not pleasant to do in your head. That's 600 plus uh, six times 20, which is 120. So it's six times one. So six times one. So what is it? 720? Yep, 720. Right. And but but now I have an answer. And now I can plug it into here. Uh, seven times 720, which is uh, that's like what? That's that's 49 uh, hundred plus seven plus what 140 unless my math is completely broken what is that is that five four is that 50 40 or did i completely mess it up you can't really do these things in your head once it gets to a certain point yeah it's 50 40 oh cool now i feel i don't feel so uh so so stupid anymore great Okay, so, but what I did is that basically I broke each problem down into a smaller version of itself. If we were to genericize this, um, we would turn this out. This would become, uh, if we had n factorial, n factorial can always be rephrased as n times n minus one factorial. Does that make sense? We can always rephrase any n factorial into n minus one factorial, which of course means that I could do it as n times n minus one times n minus two factorial. I could always pull that out, but I'd pull that out on the next step. So, what makes recursion interesting is that basically it looks like magic because we're going to be calling a function on itself. Now we've done this accidentally sometimes. I'm sure you may have encountered this sometimes. Like if I do def of a is equal to, uh, let's just do this print. Okay, and then call a. You do something like this, this is technically recursion, but You'll see that this gives us a, if I, do, if I call this, this is going to give us a he, bit of a headache. It's going to run, and then we are going to get a bunch of zeros. I'm sorry, a bunch of exclamation points, right? So A calls this, which calls A, which calls this, which calls, so the function calls itself. And it, you'd think it'd be an infinite loop, which mathematically it is, but realistically, it's not. We get an error, a recursion error, also sometimes referred to as the stack overflow error where the maximum recursion depth was exceeded. In other words, we dug too deep. Um, you'll learn more about this in upper level classes, but essentially each time we make a, a, a function call, we store where we were when we got called. So then when we're done with the function, we can go back to where we were. You know, normally this in, in programs, you're, you're only gonna go, you aren't gonna go too deep with that. With recursion, you can, and there's just so much there's only so much your your can compute. We the the programming language allows you to hold before it says, and it looks like we broke something, so we're going to stop now before we eat up all the memory. Generally preferable. Okay, but so we're going to be doing this, but in a controlled manner. You see, the problem with this was that we didn't have a stopping point. So basically, um, recursive recursion recursive problems have two pro uh, basically two cases. 
One, the recursive case. Basically, the fact that we can take some n, okay, that we can take some n and turn it into a pro and rephrase it in terms of n minus one. Okay, in this case, it was n. So the so the first property it is has some recursive case. So for instance, we had n factorial is equal to n minus one, or sorry, n times n minus one factorial. That was our recursion, what our recursive case is. Then we have what's called a base case. Remember, this is all about being lazy. So what we call to the what we call the base case is, is that point at which we can say, well, I can't get any lazier than this, which is like, depending on your definition, it's either going to be like when n is one or n is zero. One vectorial is what? Not a trick question. Right. Doesn't get much easier than that. Base case, one factorial is one. Also, interestingly enough, because of the recursion, we say one zero factorial is one. Uh, I'm not sure we, why is it zero factorial is one. It's just what the mathematicians say, and I'm, I'm not going to argue with them. They spent way too much time on their PhDs for that, so sure. Um, so we have the recursive case, and we have a base case. And then we have rule number. So, so to solve a problem with uh, recursively, you have to have three rules. One, there must be recursive cases. Two, there must be a base case, or or there can be base cases, right? Right. You can have multiple ways of solving of saying, "Hey, we got to the end of this problem." And because it's all, it's almost three o'clock, I will be going over this in more detail on Thursday because it is a really cool tool and people seem to appreciate it. Okay. Um, and finally, the last thing. Rule number three, recursive uh, cases move towards the base case. That means if I start at a recurse at some, some number that's not a base case, I'm eventually going to make my way down to the base case, right? For, in, for instance, solving seven factorial means I have to solve six factorial. Six factorial means five factorial. Five factorial means four factorial. Four factorial means I'm going to solve three factorial. Three factorial means I'm going to solve two factorial. Two factorial means I'm going to solve one factorial. And one factorial means I'm going to solve zero factorial, which means, and zero factorial is our base case. So once I get to zero factorial, I'm, that's, I'm, I'm done. I don't have to calculate anything else. Could have also stopped at one factorial. So let's go ahead and see how that looks in code. Um, def factorial. Are there negative factorials? Great question. Uh, we will, um, let's go ahead and go to the Google machine. Are there negative factorials. So Quora says, and you can trust this answer because they, you just saw that they were doing their questions in, in script over there. So it's saying, yeah, it's undefined. Factorial is only used for non-negative integer numbers. And that's and and that makes sense because right you if you did negative one factorial the recursive case would always move away from it although I I could see an argument that basically that um, that negative that negative n factorial is nothing you could are i could see a face case for basically calculating negative n factorial as negative one times n factorial right could see a case for me but that's not the way the mathematicians like it so what we're going to do is we're going to say hey um so let's go ahead and define our recursive case first or actually we always easier to find our base case first what is our base case? If n equal equals zero, right? If n is equal to zero, then what is our answer? If, if we're looking at zero factorial, what is our answer? One. Yep. 
So you're wait, you're going you're going, wait a second, Professor Rosen. Are you gonna do n is equal to two? Sorry, n is equal to one, two, one, do this, and if n is equal to two, do this, n is equal. No, I'm lazy. I'm lazy, not gonna do any of that. Although that is a fun program to write. I've I've seen people make those jokes about like uh about if numbers are, you know, checking if numbers are, e writing a program to check if a number is even an, or odd and it's a 20 megabyte file checking uh, up to some arbitrary number in if else statements. And no, they don't actually write that. They use a program to write that, which is hilarious, right? So otherwise, if we're not in the base case, we're in the recursive case, which we can define factorial as And this is where basically most people will be following me up to here. So if you feel lost, don't feel bad. It's fine if you get lost right here. And that's it. So that's how we calculate a factorial. So let's go ahead and test it to make sure there aren't any obvious errors before I do anything. So factorial of, of seven, we've kind of already defined that. And let's go ahead and remember to print that because otherwise we're not gonna see an answer. Um, oh, right. There we go. 5040. Yeah, I'm like, why is it running? Oh, it ran. I just was scrolled all the way. To, I was scrolled up a bit. Right. And let's go ahead and test this on five, which you've done before, 120. Great. Uh, by the way, these numbers get up big very fast. Um, and Python does not, by the way, Python does not care if it has to deal with, uh, with big numbers. Python's amazing like that. Other programming languages, they, they, they have certain max limits for numbers and Python's like, that's just silly. I can make bigger numbers. And so it does. Ah, here though, we, we, it got too big. Maximum recursion death exceeded. So, oh, well, uh, let's go ahead and see maybe doing 500 factorial. Can you do that for me? Oh, there we go. And we know, and it's, yeah, it's a fairly big number. All right, great. So, okay, so how does this work? Excellent question, Andrew. It's a very good question. Okay, so the way this works is that, and I'm gonna pull up my, I'm gonna pull up with my pen and move my keyboard out of the way so I can draw on my own screen, which is pretty good. Love being able to vandalize my own work. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and test, you know, we've got factorial five. And so if we pass five into here, right, what's gonna happen? Everybody can see my, uh, my horrible chicken scratch uh, handwriting? Yes, no? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so we passed five into here. We're asking, hey, is five zero? No, it's not. Okay, so we're gonna go down into the else case. In which case we are going to return, we are going to return five times factorial of N minus one. Well, N is five, so this means return factorial of four, but we have to solve what factorial of four is before we can go there. So we pass four into this function now. And so a function can call itself. There's no problem with that. Okay. And so now we pass four in, so we pass four in there and four is not zero. So we say return four times three. Let me draw it over here. Four times factorial three, which will then do two, uh, three times factorial two, and so on and so forth until it gets to, until we pass in a zero. Now, once we pass in a zero, it will return one. And it will return one to n is equal to one, and we'll have one times uh, one, which is one that will get passed back to, to factorial two, which will say, ah, that 
two times one factorial is two times one. So that's going to pass back uh, a two to here. I just did that because I was running out of space. Three times two is six. So we're going to pass back six. So factorial three is six. So then we do four times six, which gives us 24. 24 times five is 120. So it basically goes all the way down to the simplest point and then uses that to build up the answer. It's a very powerful tool and we can see it, its power a lot with, uh, with mathematical uh, definitions, but it's also extremely useful problem solving where you're like, the problem is too big, I can't solve the thing. Okay, just solve what is the most optimum move to make at this point. Um, one of the things I do in 2168, and I'll be happy to show you, is we write a, is that you can use recursion to solve really awesome puzzles like this guy, Sudoku. Let's go to the New York Times if you're unfamiliar with Sudoku. Uh, Sudoku is a puzzle basically that we write that says, uh, sorry, it's a puzzle that basically says, hey, uh, we need to put in, we need to fill in this, all the squares with numbers. Uh, numbers can only appear once in the row, in each of the rows. So there can only be one, one, one in the first row, one, one in the second row. If I try to put a one, uh, if I try to put a one over here, it's going to yell at me saying, hey, you can't have two ones in the same row. This all, rule also applies to columns. Can't have two ones in the same column. And finally, uh, you can't have the, uh, a, one, a one in the, in, a one in the same two by three, in the same three by three square. You see how this thing is split up. So it's three rules like that. Now, how do we, do, how do I create a, a great a uh, Sudoku solver using recursion? Honestly, it's uh, uses something called recursive backtracking, which is basically, it's really dumb. And I'll demonstrate how that works right now. It says, ah, oh, solving Sudoku is so hard, but maybe I can solve this square. Well, that doesn't work. Well, that doesn't work. Well, that doesn't work. Well, that doesn't work. Well, that works. Let's move on to the next square. Oh, this is so hard. Well, at least maybe I can try solving this square. Well, that doesn't work. Well, that works. Oh, that square is already done. Let's go to the next square. Oh, that square is already done. Let's go to the next square. Oh, this problem is so hard. Well, maybe I can solve this, this square and do a function call on the rest. Oh, that doesn't work. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. Ah, let's go on to the next square. Aha. Now this works pretty well for one of these uh, because I'm not gonna run into a dead end so soon, I don't think. Wait, maybe, ah, oh, too bad. Nope, wow, I'm getting pretty far with this technique. <laughs> oh, no, too bad. I'm waiting for a point where I have to backtrack. The, the longer I have to wait, the more painful it's gonna get, I bet. And then again, it's an easy, it's, it's, it's classified as one of the easy puzzles. So two, gee, this is gonna be really pathetic if I can solve the whole puzzle like this. Okay, finally, finally. So what happens here? It's like, ah, this puzzle was too tough. I can't solve this square. So obviously that's not my fault though. It's somebody else's fault, uh, fault, right? Somebody, it's not my fault, not this square's fault. It's whoever called me, it's their fault. So I'm gonna backtrack, tell that part, tell the function who called me, your solution was wrong. And it's like, okay, so this problem didn't, so, and so he goes, oh, this problem didn't work. Let's move on to the next one. Nope, nope. Okay, that works. Now let's try again. Aha, solution presents itself. And that's how recursive backtracking works. It basically says, let me go until I hit a dead end. And then I'm going to back up until I'm no longer at a dead end until I can make a choice. And then I'm going to go forward again. 
this works for mazes, this works for Sudoku, it works for, for uh, placing queens on a chessboard. <laughs> again, and again, the entire philosophy of this is just being lazy, right? It's saying the problem is too big for me to solve by glancing it at it all at once. So I'm gonna break this puzzle into small pieces, into in, not into small pieces, but into basically, not even the small pieces. I'm just gonna break it into the piece I can solve right now and then the rest of the puzzle. I'm gonna solve this little piece right now. In this case, right over here, what was the piece I could solve right now? It was the N. And the rest of it, the hard bit, that was N minus one factorial. And then we just do that for, and then we just keep doing that. All right, I'm gonna leave you now. As amazing as I pumped up factor, uh, a pumped up uh, recursion, there are issues where there are sometimes issues. Uh, there are times when it will uh, send you in the wrong direction. So I'm gonna leave you with what's also typically the first thing we learn because it's a beautiful recursive function for mathematicians, and it's a horrible, horrible, heinous. A trick to perform on computer programmers because our computers hate it. it. Brings me to tears how much we hate it or how much our computers hate it. Um, but it's a beautiful function. It's um, the Fibonacci sequence, which is which is as follows. Um, one, one, two, three, five, eight, 13. And no, I don't have this sequence memorized. It's not actually one you have to memorize. It's actually a fairly straightforward function if you haven't seen it before, if you've not been exposed to the Da Vinci Code, uh, because it featured quite heavily in that movie slash book. The recur so this is what we call the Fibonacci function, uh, the and, uh, or the Fibonacci sequence. And what it is, is that it is the nth Fibonacci number is the sum of the previous two Fibonacci numbers. So here, and here we have two base cases, one and one. Some people like to start at zero and one, but I find that silly. Uh, but we've got one, the first Fibonacci number is one, the second Fibonacci number is one, okay? Makes sense. So the third Fibonacci number is two because it's the sum of the two previous Fibonacci numbers. Three is the sum of the previous two Fibonacci numbers. Five is the sum of the previous two Fibonacci numbers. Eight is the sum of the previous two. Does this make sense to everybody? Did I lose anybody here? If I did, don't feel bad about being lost here. Um, this is considered to be a very elegant function. I mean, I don't know what makes it necessarily more elegant than other ones, um, but we'll see that like, you know, we've got this. So here we've got one, one, two, three, five, eight, 13, 21. It's because the ratio that it comes up to is uh, comes up with a so-called golden ratio, uh, golden ratio. Um, basically, so a, a plus B over A, it, it, it's around 1.6, that's the ratio. And you can kind of draw this very nice spiral as it comes out. Uh, it's, I mean, it's really cool. Don't get me wrong. Um, but, you know, there, 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 there's other things in uh, mathematics which are quite elegant too. Um, but, um, so what this fun sequence is, is, Let's see, first Fibonacci sequence is, so they start at zero. Yeah, under some older definitions, the zero Fibonacci number is emitted and we start with F of one, if two is equal to one, that's fine. And then we have this recurrence. F of one N is equal to F of N minus one plus F of N minus two. So the nth Fibonacci number is the sum of the previous two. Um, I typically do demoing after class. like after class. So, let's go, so let's go ahead and program this out now because that does remind me, um, oh, yes, then I, I, I don't see why not. So let's go ahead and 
uh, I'm going to call it def fib for short because so I'm and n here is the nth Fibonacci number. And I'm going to say if n is less than or equal to two, return one because our first Fibonacci number or our second Fibonacci number is going to be a one. Make sense? That's our base case. The first Fibonacci number or the second Fibonacci number. Otherwise, what the Fibonacci number is going to be, otherwise we are going to do return the sum of the previous two Fibonacci numbers, Fib of n minus one plus Fib of n minus two. Okay. And so print Fib of, so our fourth Fibonacci number should be three. Which it is. Well, here I am typing again on my on my laptop keyboard when I can just be doing it on this. And so our tenth Fibonacci number is fifty five. That's pretty cool. And these numbers grow pretty quickly too, not as quickly as factorial, but they grow. And the forty Fibonacci number is dot 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 dot. Now in Java, normally I can get up to like the fifties, but then I'm on my desktop. Let's go. okay, maybe maybe that's maybe that's a quirk or something. Okay, let's, let's just go. Let's go stop this. Maybe that's a quirk. It's not a quirk. It's just so thirty. At thirty-five. Notice that that took a bit. Thirty-six. And that's also, this is actually going to, if that was a bit, this time it's going to take two bits. And this will take four bits. Bit being an arbitrary amount of time. Oh, that certainly won't, won't fly. We'd be waiting uh, for the universe to die at that point for it to get done. Um, but it's getting slower and slower. Now, why is this? Why is it why is it taking so long to calculate these? Well, to calculate the the nth Fibonacci number, I have to calculate f of n minus one, and I have to calculate f of n. minus two. And to calculate f of n minus one, I have to calculate f of n minus two, and I have to calculate f of n minus three. I mean, for, for, I mean, so factorial work back to the base case, just. Okay, so what is the issue here? The issue is this. The way I've wrote, written it, it uh, is the mathematical way. And the mathematical way isn't saving any answers. So to calculate f of n minus one, I have to calculate f of, uh, f of n minus two and f of n minus three. Okay, and so when I'm finally done with this branch, of calculations, the first, once I've done finish figuring out what this is, I have to calculate this side. Well, I've already calculated that, but you wouldn't know that. Ben, yes, you can in fact use dynamic programming. In fact, that's the just way to do this. Um, in fact, that gets into my next point for the question. So part of this is because we keep repeating our work. So I wanna leave you for this for the beginning of our next lecture. What are some solutions to make sure that we can run, uh, that this can run much quicker? What are ways we can ensure that we don't have to keep redoing the work again and again and again and again? All right, so with that, I'll dismiss the class. Now, Anthony, I, I see that you wanted a demo, so 